today builds what our future is. So a lot of us build like we know the future, but that's only repeating our past because we're already taking action from our memories rather than the possibility of what we have no idea yet. Exactly. We, we can only create within the limits of our, of our fate almost with what we think we know. And, and one of the great humbling things for me is I, I know the more I learn, the more I realise how little I know. And I want to create from the pool of information that I don't know about. <laughs> I want to tap into the massive unknown and bring in that with me. Wonderful to, to see you here and thank you so much for joining me. No, my pleasure. And uh, I couldn't resist going outside. I, I work all the time indoors. So you, you've given me a little glimpse of opportunity to come outside. So thank you for that too. My, my pleasure. So, so you and I have been working together for the last few months. Uh, well, almost uh, eight months, I think, actually. And I'd love you to introduce yourself as in who you are to me and my journey. Uh, okay, well, I'm... Andrew Kempleton. I'm a uh, therapist in the complementary healthcare regime, so basically kinesiology, which I've been doing for about <clears throat> 20 years. In the last five years, I've introduced some uh, shamanic practice, having trained with the spirit of the Inca. So uh, I've been around the medicine wheel with them, and that's something we may talk about during our little slot here. Uh, so I've done that training, and I've, without going into too much, I've been working with Kate just to explore um, life, which is what I love to do with people and just see how we can bring more life to our lives really. And, uh, and this, uh, this adventure is an opportunity to, to do exactly that. And, and I feel my role is to just look into the, um, the corners, the crevices that, um, that are easily missed. And that's often at the levels above the physical and the mental. Um, that's maybe what we'll talk about a bit today. Yeah. And it's interesting because, um, I suppose if you look at my life up until a few years ago, I, I achieved quite, quite high in a lot of areas, but a few, a few points in my life just felt stuck and it was nothing I was doing. It was nothing I was thinking. It was, there was just some sort of blocks and that's kind of what brought me to your door was to work out what was going on and how could I unstick to allow life to keep moving fluidly in the directions that I wanted it. Yeah, we've had some fun and hopefully we'll have some more. And uh... Yeah. So, you know, I'm very curious because you've hinted to me a few times that, you know, you've got a few world firsts. And you've told me what they are. So... This is, this, yeah, in any other company, I'd be delighted to have gone into great detail. But in, in the company of genuine world record holders, <laughs> then I feel a bit, uh, a bit overwhelmed by them. But I'll, I'll tell you what they are. The, um, the, the first one was... Uh, and it's a very different world from yours. Yours is about kind of elite endurance uh, athleticism and mine's more all sport. And when I was at school, I was playing cricket in a, in a match against another school and I took a, took a hat trick, which I never did again in my life, uh, which is fairly unusual. But then there was one delivery gap when someone hit a single and then I took another hat trick. So I don't know if you know much about cricket, but six wickets and seven balls is pretty unusual and I've tried to google it and I know it's never been done in professional cricket but I suspect somewhere out there someone's done it but that, that's my uh, that's my kind of claim to fame in a, in a school match and these these boys were running backwards and forwards couldn't get pads on quick enough because the, the wickets were tumbling all over the place wow so technically you know, it's uh, I'd like to know the only way you can do more than that is to take six wickets and six deliveries and I'm uh, I haven't heard of that happening so who knows I, I like to think that it's uh, unusual um, but if someone out there knows differently then I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be knocked off my pedestal. It's, it's a wonderful achievement and you know I, I appreciate you for acknowledging the, the, what I'm what I'm attempting but but what you did is also amazing as well so it's it's not it's not the size of the game it's the game itself so it's, it's wonderful. Yeah it's uh, and it has a a message for me and maybe for you that I'll, I'll touch on in a second but the the other interesting one for me was uh, again ball sport golf but about 20 years ago uh, I play or played at a golf club where uh, the first hole is a par four which means you should take two shots to get there with, but with modern equipment we were getting closer and closer every year as, as equipment got got better a bit like probably with cycling the, the equipment's improving all the time and then one year I the first time I'd ever got the ball onto the green in one go it went straight into the hole 
for a hole in one. And that was, a, again, a sort of club record because no one uh, had, uh, had previously aced the first hole at Long Ashton Golf Club. So uh, that was my little claim to fame that went around uh, the, the evening post. That was <laughs> the extent of my infamy was a local newspaper did about a, a little photo caption 20 years ago. Uh, but what was interesting with that is that after 120 years, I was the first person to get a hole in one. Someone else did it the year after. Wow. And that is interesting to me. So as a person of statistics, statistics was always my thing at school. I used to love maths and probabilities and the odds of drawing a jack of spades after a queen of hearts and all this kind of thing. And I, and I feel I've, I've lived a life that's defied statistics. And um, if you have for me to just outline the, what I think the interesting thing in this is, is that um, number one, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And I'm a very ordinary sportsman, but I've done two things that I think are quite out of the ordinary. So how did that happen? Um, second thing is when someone does something extraordinary, it seems to make it easier for the next person to follow alongside that. And that really intrigues me because what does that say about, um, not just about sport, what does that say about you climbing Everest? What does that say to the people who, when you do that, when you push your levels of commitment, of courage, of dedication, of, uh, of vision, and you break forward and you push the bar up a little bit, what does that do for everybody else with their own Everest? What does that do for people who say, I'm not gonna climb that mountain like Kate, but I, I need to leave this relationship and I haven't had the courage to do it. Mm. So I'm really interested that it, my way was meaningless. It's a ball in a hole. It doesn't matter, but it's about what does that open up in life for people who, who see other people being courageous and pushing their boundaries and then make it easier to follow suit. And, and I really believe love and compassion works in the same way. So um, I've worked under mentors who say there are ways that when you open up into more love, you uh, open the doorway for other people to follow. And in relation to... COVID and the world we're in, I think that's important too. So it may be a golf story, but I, I do think there's a bigger message. I think it's, it's about pushing doorways, opening up boundaries, making it easier for other people to follow, for other people to be the hero of their own lives. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, from what you said about you, you had to believe, you had to aim to, to that hole to, to get a hole in one. So there was an element of belief in you even before attempting it, that there may be a possibility it would happen. And, and the same for me, you know, I have to believe that I'll achieve it. And just that grain of possibility thrown out into the ether could open up a whole new world for somebody else. And I think you've just, um, it's almost as if we rehearsed this, but that's exactly the cue for the third point that I think is really relevant. And that is exactly that, that life is about grains of possibility. And having studied all these statistics, if someone said to me, oh, you've got a one in 100 chance of making this work. Um, in the olden days, I would say, that's tricky, that's a problem. There's 99 dead ends or possibilities of failure there. Nowadays, with my shamanic hat on, I would say, that's great, I just need the one chance. Mm. Don't need the other 99. I need to know what that one chance looks like so that I can align with that. Um, what does it feel like? What's its vibration? What's its color? What training do I have to do to align with that? And, um, and the shaman have been working with this for, thousands of years that's what's so amazing the kind of stuff we're learning now in quantum physics and motivation and possibility that they've been working with this since the medieval ages it's, it's incredible what they what they know and and so to a shaman they would just say yeah give me that one chance that's all i need i'll just align with that and from a treatment perspective uh there is something you can do called the transition rights which um we may well uh, do it would be quite interesting where you call in from the future the version of you that's most actualized in relation to that goal so we might speak to the version of Kate it may I don't know what the odds are of you doing this huge world record attempt say it was one in five just the random guess we would call into the room the version of you that's the one that uh, that made the trip and I, I wouldn't necessarily say that means that you completed everything but just the version of you that got the most from that experience you could and i would want to call that version in and find out what she has what the gifts are that we can introduce energetically to align you with her path so 
that's a shamanic protocol. It's been done for thousands of years to align people with their destiny rather than with their fate. The path of their choosing, their vision, not the path that's set out for them by their ancestors, by their wounding, by their poor parenting. Um, you can leave that aside and choose the path that you want. Yeah, it's very powerful because a lot of us live like today. Today builds what our future is. So a lot of us build like we know the future, but that's only repeating our past because we're only taking action from our memories rather than the possibility of what we have no idea yet. Exactly. We, we can only create within the limits of our, of our fate almost with what we think we know. And, and one of the great humbling things for me is I, I know the more I learn, the more I realize how little I know. And I want to create from the pool of information that I don't know about. <laughs> I want to tap into the massive unknown and bring in that wisdom and work from that. Yeah. And that's why I'm really humbled and grateful that you're part of my journey because I can only ask people questions from a status of knowing. Even when I don't know it, I know that I don't know it. So, so it's an already given. I, I need people in my team, of which you're one of them, to look in areas that I have no idea that even exist to, to highlight elements that I need to bring into the light. That's wonderful. Thank you. And, and for me, I'm also journeying into that darkness myself. I can, I can do shamanic journeying. We can tune into your higher self through kinesiology, but I'm working with you from a place of not knowing and saying, well, let's ask that question. Let's see if we journey to that place. Let's see what answers we get back. So that's why I love doing what I do because we, we're on the trip together we're in the and i've learned things through other people's not knowing and through my own not knowing it's been a real yeah. real journey yeah and it's very it's what it's very refreshing to have people who are experts to say i have no idea because it's in that space we can actually grow absolutely and, and uh, yeah i'm glad you used the word expert in inverted commas because I, I i really struggle with the word and i would never claim to be an expert myself because i've i've been humbled too many times by what i don't know and by clients I can't help and it, it keeps me very grounded. So I've learned a few things in 20 odd years of practice, but I, I've also learned a huge number of things that I don't know <laughs> or, or learned about all the spaces that have yet to be filled in. And it's, uh, that's what keeps me motivated. Yeah, that's wonderful. So, so thinking specifically about what I, what's coming up for me with, with our known state of in two years time, I'll be cycling, you know, pretty much 20 hours a day covering 3000 miles. Then two months later, immersing myself in quite cold water for 21 miles and then summiting in high altitudes, Everest. What challenges, how can I address this challenge, challenge on a sort of emotional, spiritual and health aspect? That's a big question. Um, I would, um, what I'd like to do is just cover the perceptual states um, that I think may carry some gaps. There are four that I'd like to just quickly cover. And then I think you'll find some of them are more covered than others. And uh, we can then see where those spaces are and where the work might be needed. That's okay. Yeah. And, and again, I'm going to the indigenous cultures. I'm going back to the beautiful people of Peru and the spirit of the Inca and their teachings about the medicine wheel. And they have four perceptual states. And the first one is uh, the south, the, the place of serpent energy. And this is the literal. And if you can, Kate, come with me on this. I have a vision of you being halfway up Everest. Okay, so go to that place and on a rock face, uh, whatever you're doing, uh, roped or climbing in ice, whatever you're doing, and go into that place of serpent. And serpent is a place of things are exactly as they appear to be. And I suggest that when you're climbing a mountain, you need to be very present uh, and very literal in the way you have that experience. It's not a time to be thinking about what you might be doing on your summer holidays next year. You need to be very present for probably hour after hour after hour. And that's a level of serpent. And it's the place where, like right now, I'm aware that uh, I'm, I'm sitting down, there's a gentle breeze blowing in from the southwest. Uh, I'm looking at a computer screen. There's some ducks in the background I can hear. It's a non-judgmental, very present place. Uh, I'm also aware I had a light lunch, my stomach's full, uh, and my nutrition is set. Uh, and so that for you is going to be a very important place to be, the level of serpent. And uh, if you just imagine, if you can, being on that mountain, what would, is there any obvious thing that comes to you just at that non judgmental level? What would you, can you see that kind of um, 
perspective filter applying to that experience. Can you see how that might work? Yeah, the first thing I saw were clouds drifting off the top of the mountain to be able to see the wind and the interaction of the, the ice and snow that I'll be walking up later. Okay, and so that would be, that would take us to the next level. So the next level would be the level of Jaguar, uh, where uh, this is about where things are not as they appear to be. And this is where uh, stories appear. This is where, um, oh my goodness, I don't think I'm fit enough. I wish I'd done more training. Uh, my hands are cold. I don't think I can make it any further. And uh, this is the place where you might look at those clouds and think, oh, I wonder if that's a storm coming in or have we misjudged the forecast or have the winds uh, not been as predictive. And uh, mm. that is the place you can work on in advance and, and pre-plan those scenarios and work out what belief systems you might have that go against them. And uh, remember, if we do the transition rights, we will be choosing uh, the experience where there are no surprise uh, weather patterns, because that might be one of the other possibilities that we're going to walk away from, yeah? Just yeah. as, a, as an aside, when, when I got married here about eight years ago, we got married in the wettest summer on history, I think it was 2012, and we doused and got, there was one date that we should choose and we just chose it randomly. And it turned out to be one of two sunny weekends in the entire summer. And we didn't know what we were doing, but we, we were being given the, the, the path of destiny that worked best for us. So I think if you might find that there are possibilities to just get lucky, to just choose the, uh, the timing for the ascent. Um, that you say, wow, that was lucky. We just had a break in the weather just when we needed it. And it won't be lucky, it's because you've done the work. Mm. Yeah. But anyway, that, that's the, the level of Jaguar is that perspective of, of um, belief systems, fears, stories, childhood upbringing, success and failure. It's a particular filter. Um, if you go up to the next level, which is uh, the north, that's hummingbird. And that's, that's where I'm more interested, to be honest, because I think that the previous two levels are the levels of nutrition, of training, of coaching, of um, core belief work. Um, but I love the North because that's the hummingbird energy. That's the great journeyer, the great traveler, the hummingbird. Um, but it's also the place of sweetness and it's the place of curiosity. So at some point, maybe where you are on this mountain, you'd be saying, why on earth am I doing this? And you may have a moment. And bearing in mind the mountain is a living conscious being. It's not a piece of rock, not to my belief system. It's a... Uh, uh, and the, the shamans see the wisdom of our species kept in the mountain tops. So as you get higher up the mountain, there's that potential to just stop for a moment and be inspired. You know, your, your serpent level will be saying, goodness, my legs ache. Your jaguar will be saying, hope I can make this. Uh, I don't want to let down my family and my supporters. And your hummingbird energy will be saying, I just think I'm getting closer to spirit. I think I I think I've found something here that's very special and there'll be a spark of wisdom that you can bring back. Mm. So I'd really encourage you to go to that, uh, to be open to that place coming to find you for that mountain speaking to you when, uh, when, when she wants to. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I don't have a tattoo, but I've always said if I wanted one and a statement, it would be of a hummingbird. So of all of everything. We need to talk more about that, but um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the hummingbird, Tiny Wings journeys from Peru or South America all the way up to Canada every year. How, does, how do they do it? It's not mm -hmm. physically possible. You know, it would be a brilliant emblem for you to take on your journey. We, we don't know how she did it. It shouldn't really have been possible, but somehow Kate did it. Uh, it it's a beautiful symbol for you. So I think you're already tuned in. You just, you're, you're working shamanically without knowing necessarily that that's what you're doing. You're being inspired. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh -huh. And just the final stage, the, uh, the place of the East is uh, a place where everything is and isn't at the same time. It's the place of quantum physics. It's the place which I love. The, have you heard of the double slit experiment? Have you heard of that one where they fired photons through um, two slits and they behaved as though they were energy and matter all at the same time? And so the scientists thought, we'll observe that, we'll put a camera there and see what the photon, which path it chooses. And as soon as they observed it, the, uh, the energy switched from energy into matter. And the only thing they'd pick up on the other end was, was matter. So 
So basically, we live in a, a world of quantum soup of energy and potential. But as soon as we bring our consciousness to it, as soon as we look at it, uh, it becomes real, it becomes solidified. So your whole trip is, uh, and I have this image of everybody turning their back on Everest. And as soon as we take our awareness away, she turns into this soup of energy. And as soon as we turn around again, it solidifies as a mountain. And that may sound crazy, but that's quantum physics. In every millisecond, matter is moving between wave and particles. So you're climbing a wave, you're climbing energy that most of the time will appear to you as rock and snow and ice, but it's energy. So how are you going to relate to that? And bearing in mind it's energy, it means it's not over in Tibet or Nepal. It means you can connect with it tomorrow. You could, if we had time, you could, uh, uh, we could sit with it right now and ask Everest for its message to you. Ask the, uh, the, the waters of the world. You can connect to the channel crossing and, and, and also ask the Atlantic and the Pacific. And it's all there for you. So um, I really hope you get to that place as well. That's what I want to help you with is it's not just about, wow, I did it in 27 hours, 22 minutes and only had to recharge my fuel. But I'm not, that's not my world, you know, not anymore. I, I want to help you on those higher two levels of, uh, of the energy, the messages, the wisdom and how that helps you be a role model for other people what doorways you push open for others to walk through more easily. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And what you say is, is true, and a lot of us feel it. So it may not just be in physical, but we, we get into a space of time stops, or time is fluid, where we're in flow state or in the zone, however we want to call it. And I think it's those moments that we are connected to everything and nothing that, that, that are magical, that create the world we live in. Absolutely. And in those moments of magic of total connection to oneness in the place of the east we step outside of time it's not a place of time so i always know that if i feel that time has stopped i think i've stepped i've connected with the cosmos the universe i know that i've found somewhere really beautiful because i'm no longer connected to linear time i've transcended it for that moment i wish i could stay there all the time um, but uh, on this human plane there's enough, uh, you only have to turn the telly on and we'll be dragged back down into a, a, a much different perspective and much more linear time. Yeah, yeah. And what, what uh, you know, to move on a little bit from this path, but also covering what you've discussed earlier, where, where I'm visiting is also a place of sacred beauty. And, and I want to also make sure that I don't see it exactly as you said, like a time to beat or a tick list to get, you know, to tick off the list. This is a journey of sacred land. And I'd love your input in that as well. Yeah, and uh, we've touched on this and it's that really uncomfortable area of white privilege. And you and I have it. I can only give guide you um, very loosely and refer you to people who can give you their wisdom on it. But it's really important. If you're cycling across America, I'm thinking of the Oregon Trail, the Trail of Tears, the displacement of the native americans um, people dying being taken away to their reservations and how do you honor that you know this is sacred land how do you make sure that it's not just a piece of tarmac that's been built through a state that's um, flat or high or easy to travel or too hot or too cold you know very serpent view of it uh, and yeah how, who are the people who are the medicine people of that land and what is the energy of that land that you need to seek permission of and even with their permission, uh, how do you honor the, the, the gifts that you've been given? Because us white people, we're very good at going to a place and saying, thank you, I want your culture, I want your minerals, I want your music, your experience, your weather, um, and worst case, your people. You know, that's what we've done over our history. So it's really important for me that your trip leaves a, a trail of very low ripples, this very soft belly upon the earth that you, leave trails of gratitude and permission as you go. Why, how you do that, who are these, who are the people who are the custodians of that land? Who are the spirits who are custodians of the land? Who is the custodian of Everest? You know, it's one thing getting visas from governments, but who are the medicine people of the mountain who, who look after it spiritually? And they're the people that I would love you to, to find and to seek their permission, you know, and potentially even if, be prepared for them to say no. I don't think it's going to happen, but if you're going to ask someone's permission and for their wisdom, you need to be prepared for them to say, you can't come. Yeah. It's, it's uh, but at least it's a conversation that I think needs to be had. 
Yeah, and pretending it isn't there, pretending it didn't happen is it doesn't do it doesn't give service and it doesn't shed light on on reality on life as we know it. Absolutely. Yeah, and and you know I do acknowledge that both you and I are white talking about our own privileges, so we're in a little bit of our own bubble, and it's it, part of my journey, and that's why I have two years, and that's why I chose to announce it so early in the journey is to find these experts is to bring awareness is to have deeper conversations with people who can help me absolutely and part of our of white privilege is for you and i to think that we have all the answers and we can solve this for other indigenous people who've been um suffered at our hands and we can't and it it's white centering it's it's very dangerous trap to fall into so even me talking about it now is 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 controversial and even me practicing shamanically is controversial because I've uh, we've been given these teachings from uh, the shaman of Peru and they said please share them with the world because the world is going to change and of course they were right we're right in the middle of it now and so they wanted us to be part of that shift but it's still it's their culture and I have to be really careful that I'm not taking from them and charging people to practice shamanically and not being in right relationship so I'm very aware of my need to support South American charities and and even then I'm just scratching the surface of what needs to be done to stay in balance you know and I, I feel that for me as a practitioner of someone else's culture and I feel that for you traveling in their land we need to tread really carefully and very very respectfully. Yeah I completely agree and you know I do want to bring consciousness and that respect into into my travels so thank you so much for bringing that as well into this conversation for others to hear and, and hold me to account as much as support me as well. Yeah, and people will hold me to account as well. We all need to be called in. We all need to be held to account when we when we slip away from the right path. And it's up, you know, with these terrible things happening in America right now, that this kind of conversation is, needs to be had. And uh, and uh, and for us, we need to listen really hard right now, and 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 see how how we should respond to it. But we need to listen at the moment and not uh, uh, listen to other people and, and not think we have the answers. Yeah, very true. Very true indeed. Well, I could, I could talk with you for hours, Andrew, and I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. Uh, if it's possible, I do like to ask the same five questions to every guest. And if I could ask you those five questions now, I'd be grateful. Yeah, sure. And you might get one word answers, but go for it. Okay. Uh, what is the one skill that leaders need today? Uh, compassion. Every day. Yeah, br brilliant. And what do you follow more, logic or intuition? Having just had that discussion, it has to be intuition. I, having come from 20 years in the bank and where it was all logic driven and now been moved to a place where I'm trying to work into the unknown, into the, uh, into the place of possibility where we only need the one chance. We don't need, we don't need to be likely even. We just need it to be possible. Uh, it's intuition every time. Yeah, great. That wasn't one word, but I'm very happy you explained. Sorry. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I was just joking. Um, and how do you deal with failure or the perception of not achieving goals? Uh, I would, I don't even accept the question anymore. Uh, I think it's, it's time for us to let go of, for me, any idea of success and failure sits alongside good and bad, right and wrong. Um, that they're all judgments they're all aspects of duality and polarity and again going back to what we've just talked about what's happening in america it, it, it can lead us to i know it's a, it's a strong thing to say but it can take us into that kind of energy my my world is not about success and failure anymore it's about essence and vision and if i and for you i would wish for you to have a vision for your trip that is okay you have targets but it's about coming back a bigger more loving person than you went or whatever your your targets are and you're definitely going to achieve that. So for me, you cannot fail on that trip. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it takes it above the superficiality of of the action, the serpent energy, as I think you called it. Exactly. Yeah. And we need that. We need the world to be working from that place now. We need to be holding a vision of of the world in her healed state, where we live as one people, loving each other, respecting each other. And your trip is part of that. You know, it, it starts in that place. If you come back saying, I failed, I should have done more, I let myself down, we're back in duality again. We're back into a, a, into a very negative perspective. Mm, very wise, very wise. And it's a different slant for how to perceive my trip as well. So thank you for, for bringing that to awareness. And what keeps you every single day motivated to, to strive for more? 
uh, I, I go back to, um, well, two things. One is, uh, again, the, the, I love the shamanic teachings, love service wisdom. And I, I try to push these things and say, oh, there's more to life than that, but there isn't. There's nothing more to life than love, service, and wisdom. And if, we, if everything I do, uh, well, if in every day I found one of those three a little bit more, then I'm happy. You know, there's rest and play as well, but that's my driving force to find some of those at a greater level every day. Yeah, wonderful. And I would lo I'd love more love. I'd love to serve and receive serving as well. And yeah, wisdom from others is, is very important to me. So yeah, very wise. And lastly, to everyone listening, what one message would you like to leave us with? Uh, it, it is that the world is changing. I've, I've been waiting for this to happen and it's been prophesied by most traditions around the world. Uh, the world is changing fast and I don't want my little daughter to ask me in 20 years time, Daddy, what did you do when we had that choice of either dropping down the hole or or, or, or going through the, the, the this new potential possibility and to have any regrets? Uh, what I did to enhance that change. So no regrets. That, that's my message to everybody. Step up. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We can all do more with love and with wisdom. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, it's no good being active from a place of anger. Uh, for me personally, I know that there is a point where anger is important and there are lots of people very angry and they need to be angry right now. But fundamentally, we need to do our inner work so that when we move into our our calling, we bring balance to that place. At the moment, there needs to be some anger because we need to break some systems. But when that's done, then it's the time to bring the love in. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Andrew, for your words of wisdom, for your insight, as well as talking on the topics that I think a lot of people like to ignore and avoid and bringing them to light. Yeah, thank you. We need to be uncomfortable right now. This is not a time for any of us to feel too comfortable and we need to work out what we want to do about that discomfort. Yeah. And, and how can we get in touch with you for, for everyone? I know I've, I'm reading some comments here who are saying that they're in awe of your spiritual energy from another kinesiologist, as well as a few other comments about, about your, your wisdom and also, you know, not hiding away from these topics. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the two websites I have, one is the Quantum K web website, which is a free healing website. So please go on there and the Kemp Kinesiology website's there. So if anybody wants to get in touch, uh, email me and uh, let's take it from there. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your time, Andrew. I am grateful and I appreciate it. And you are definitely integral in my team to ensure that, that my path is filled with that love, service and wisdom as well. Beautiful. And thank you, Kate, for asking me to be part of that team. Thank you. Take care. Bye, I'll see you soon.